Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4. Diploma in Procurement and Supply and this is Module 8, Procurement and Supply in Practice, Learning Outcome 4, which is to demonstrate the application of ethical and responsible sourcing within an organisation. So a procurement professional needs to ensure that there are no unethical or corrupt activities within their processes or in their supply chain. Now, corruption is an unethical activity undertaken by a person with control or in authority. And these examples include things like bribery, deception, abuse of power, embezzlement and fraud. Now, bribery is the act of offering something of value in return for influence in a decision. And it's illegal in many countries, but not all. Deception is the deliberate effort to, prevent, to present false information or withhold information or influence any stage of the procurement cycle in a way that is detrimental to other parties. Abuse of power is when individuals misuse their position. Embezzlement is the taking of money or property by a person to whom it has been entrusted. And fraud is the act of deliberately securing monies from another party through dishonest methods like kickbacks and collusion, bid rigging, invoice fraud, substitution and false claims. So what are some of the ways that corruption can present itself within procurement? So what about these scenarios, offering money or gifts in return for the award of contract? or inside knowledge to gain unfair advantage against competition. Falsifying documentation, or awarding a contract to a supplier in return for a kickback, rather than on merit. On merit. Now, different countries have different practices, so gift giving or grease payments may, also, may be okay in some countries, but it's important to defer it in your country's legal definitions. So if you look at the diagram on the slide, it shows you that a purchasing organisation has no direct link with its subcontractor or the public authority. However, if the supplier has paid the local authority to overlook some performance or technical irregularities in return for the subcontractor giving kickbacks to the supplier, it's still part of the purchasing company's supply chain, so they can be responsible. Due diligence checks carried out by the purchasing organisation should reveal unethical practices. Check and verify all supplier documentation, such as regulatory compliance prior to a contract award. But other issues and critical aspects you need to investigate would include modern slavery, which includes human trafficking, bonded labour, forced labour, child labour and domestic slavery. But you also need to consider looking at human rights violations, the statutory ways in which individuals expect to and should be treated. This includes dignity and fairness, respect, equality and freedom. And they can relate to sexual orientation, gender, religious beliefs, cultural values, race, ethnicity or nationality. These areas must be examined with care during the evaluation stage. Investigate your supplier's policies and practices in relation to the treatment of their workers and the associated organisations within the supply chain. Now, the SIPS Code of Conduct outlines the actions and behaviours that SIPS members are expected to follow. Have you read and are you familiar with the Code of Conduct? Ask yourself, what's the purpose of this? So the five sections of the code firstly ask you to enhance and protect the standard of the profession. And that's by never engaging in activity that could bring the institute into disrepute. It will look at things like not accepting gifts and hospitality. It asks you to maintain the high standards of integrity in all business relationships. So likely is hood is that you need to reject anything that seems improper you know make sure you keep all of the information you have um, privy to in confidence don't mislead your suppliers or lie about an opportunity or your qualifications and make sure you disclose any potential conflicts of interest 
It then goes on to ask you to promote the eradication of unethical business practices. So here you need to harness your awareness of modern slavery and human rights abuses, fraud and corruption, and to continue to do that throughout your career. You should do your due diligence on your suppliers before you award them a contract, but also you have an obligation to take action if something comes to light that doesn't look right. It then goes on to talk about enhancing the proficiency and stature of the profession. So make sure that you lead by example. Make sure you do continued professional development. And finally, to ensure full compliance with the laws and regulations. Anyone who's a member of SIPS must agree to honour the code. It's therefore important that you familiarise yourself and understand the code to ensure we, the work we carry out meets the code guidelines. Now a code of ethics is a set of morals, values and principles that are set out by an organisation to display what they deem to be acceptable conduct and behaviour. It outlines the values and missions of an organisation and state how professionals within that organisation should behave and perform within their role. It could to contribute towards the application of responsible sourcing and it's based on Nolan's seven principles of public life which were identified in 1995. This is on the left hand side. So it's about accountability and selflessness, integrity, objectivity and leadership, honesty and openness. But it's also determined by an organisation's mission statement and values. Now, organisations and codes of practice is it may not be a legal requirement to have a code of ethics, but it is good practice. Many organisations have their code of ethics on their website or available in electronic format. And the buyer should check that potential suppliers have an ethical code of practice in the pre-qualification or supplier selection stage of the process. These codes of ethics help to give confidence that the supplier, if approved, conduct themselves in an ethical and responsible way. Whistleblowing is the exposure of reporting of information that suggests some form of wrongdoing within the workplace. And non-compliance, if the ethical code of conduct within an organisation is breached, there are consequences for both the individual who carried out the breach and often the associated organisation. So if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, let's look at the process associated with the code of ethics. Firstly, you need to define the ethics and compliance risks then prevent the ethics and compliance lapses and failures. There may be a necessary part where you need to detect any non-compliance, so doing audits and things like that. And then respond to allegations of violations. Finally, evaluate results and look to continually improve. So go back and define it, prevent it, detect it, respond, etc. Now steps to support ethical practice in the supply chain include things like carrying out strong due diligence prior to the contract being awarded, using selection and evaluation methods to assess which suppliers or potential suppliers meet the criteria associated with ethical practice, and validate claims made by suppliers by checking their documentation and ensuring that processes are, are, are actually in place. That use suppliers that are accredited or are members of associations that promote good ethical conduct. The following organisations represent good ethical conduct. First and foremost, SIPS, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. We've then got the ILO, the International Labour Organisation. The Institute of Environmental Management Assessment, the IEMA. Assured Food Standards. Carbon Trust, the Ethical Trading Initiative, the ETI, Fair Trade Foundation, an ethical company or organisation, and Anti-Slavery International. So I'd encourage you to do some research on these organisations that represent ethical conduct, primarily SIPS, the ILO, ETI, Fair Trade and Amnesty International. Where do they operate? Who are their members? What are their aims? And how do they achieve this? 
Now, supply monitoring and KPIs are where we continually monitor suppliers throughout the life of the contract to ensure that the ethical practices that were specified in the contract are being adhered to. But it also helps to ensure that ethical and responsible sourcing is being carried out, that the required procedures and standards are being adhered to by their organisation, and that the required procedures and standards are being adhered to throughout the supply, entire supply chain. So there are some examples of KPIs that relate to the measurement of ethical supply performance, such as how many complaints have been received regarding diversity? How much packaging is being recycled? What percentage of energy is generated by renewable sources? What percentage of employees that leave each year? This can be an indicator of working conditions. How many additional deliveries are made per order? This is an ind indicative assessment of pollution from transport. But KPIs measure and scores can be displayed on a dashboard, like you can see on the screen. The triple bottom line was devised by John Elkington. It advocates measuring sustainability in relation to the performance and investment against the three P's, people, planet, profit. It's a useful tool for recording how sustainable an organisation is. It should accompany by setting objectives in relation to what the three P's show and then monitored by implementing KPIs or other measures to ensure improvements are being made. So people, the social dimension, considers the effect that an organisation has on its stakeholders, such as employees, consumers, producers and suppliers. An organisation should have strong ethical principles in place and should be giving something back to its local community. The planet is the environmental dimension, considers the immediate and long term effect that an organisation has on the environment. These organisations should consider the effects of pollution and waste management and how they can use things like renewable energy and use and replenish natural resources responsibly and sustainably. And then finally, profit, the financial dimension, considers not just the amount of money made, but the continuity of the organisation and enabling good work to be carried out in the community. Organisations should consider the long term effects, not just the short term ones. Now, sustainable procurement is about balancing business needs against the economic and social development and environmental protection. Examples of sustainable practices will include evaluating and monitoring suppliers to ensure that only ethically and environmental aware organisations are awarded contracts. So, for example, working with suppliers that have and are working towards sustainability and environmental accreditations or working with suppliers that promote their allegiance to organisations like the ILO and the ETI. Consider the triple bottom line as a way of reporting on suppliers organisations and actively work to reduce environmental damage in the supply chain. For example, balancing the needs of just in time with the environmental impact of additional deliveries. Evaluate your needs and only produce and procure what's needed. Adapting and developing specifications to reflect the changing requirements of the consumer and also to comply with regulations and legislations as these are amended. Gaining standards and accreditations and removing waste from the supply chain. Applying continuous improvement to your supply chain. Developing the procurement professionals of the future and amending the specifications as you see fit. So on the screen, you'll see the factors that need to be adopted for future sustainable procurement. You need to think about your stakeholders, collaboration and cooperation, the use of big data and whole life costing, social aspects, ethics, sustainability, the environment, and then finally, value for money. And that's the end of Learning Outcome 4 and Module 4. Thank you for watching.